time you sang that song besides just now <laughs> probably at VBS or maybe as far back as when you were just a little kid Brandon read for us Ephesians 5 19 which reads read it again addressing one another in songs hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart this last this lesson kind of bran branches off of that when we sing one of the things we talked about a lot at camp because we did a lot of singing was singing. We talked about singing, what we're singing and when we're singing and how we're singing and why we're singing and who we're singing to. When we sing, we're addressing one another. We're, we're saying those things to ourselves and we're saying those things to our brothers and sisters within earshot and we're sending those things to God. When we sing a song that asks out God to help us do something, like we, we sang Light the Fire. When we sing Light the Fire, we're asking God to light the fire in us. Are we meaning that in our hearts? We're asking our brothers and sisters to help encourage us. We're asking ourselves and encouraging ourselves. So we need to think about when we sing the importance of singing and the power behind singing. And being able to sing those things truthfully and freely about ourselves or to ourselves and our brothers and sisters in Christ, and ultimately sending those things up to God. And if we have our heart in the right place, singing can be one of the greatest things that we have, one of the greatest ways we communicate with one another and with God. We also see 1 Timothy 4.12, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example. One of the things I think is kind of cool about this song is a lot of us think of it as a kid's song. And the first thing I want us to get from this is you never stop learning, or you shouldn't ever stop learning. No matter if something is, you know, what we might think of as a kiddie song or something that's like a little kid Bible, Bible story or something like that, doesn't mean that it's any less significant than anything else. And I, I kind of flipping 1 Timothy 4.12 around, we need to be, as adults or as older folks, looking to those examples that are in our young folks. A lot of folks, a lot of us that have spent time with young people or spent time teaching or things of that nature, you know, a lot of times you're the teacher and you teach them, but you learn just as much, if not more, 
from that experience on how to be an adult or how younger folks think or the, the purity in the minds of part of a child, things of that nature. And part of this is saying young folks be an example to adults, but part of it's also saying adults don't be too proud to look to young people for examples or as examples. And that's the part of this song. A lot of us might think of this as a kid song. Oh, that's something we sing at VBS. But that's still something that we can learn, learn from. And that's what I want us to study today is, is to break down these, these verses and break down the, te- the, the words that are sung in this, in this song and apply them to our life. So let's look at, these, look at these different verses, so to speak. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be careful with something? Well, you treat it with care. You, you understand how fragile something is, and you treat it accordingly. You know, when you hold a child, is different than how you hold a football is different than how you hold a bowling ball because those things are all different and they all have different levels of the attribute of being fragile, whatever you would call that, fragileness. Um, And you treat them with a certain level of care because of what those things are and because of how they can be hurt and damaged and you have to take care of them. Well, the same thing applies to these different things, your eyes, your, your ears, your mouth, so on. We, have, we need to understand how fragile those things are. A lot of times we don't think about it, but those things are very, very fragile and can easily be corrupted and destroyed, not physically, but spiritually. So we think about taking care of our eyes. What do we think of? Well, the amount of information that, that your brain computes or whatever you call it during a day is, is massive. And a huge portion of that is visual stimulus. The, the things that you see, the, the colors, the people, the faces, the images that your brain goes through, a lot of that has to do with your eyes, or all that has to do with your eyes. So what I was thinking was, you know, books. You know, what you read, what kind of, what kind of things you, you read in your spare time, what kind of movies you watch, what kind of television you watch, what kind of uh, websites on the internet you find yourself at or, or go to. Matthew 6, 22 and 23, the eye is the lamp to the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Again, going back to the idea that what we see, what we let our eyes see, goes into us and becomes a part of who we are. Whether we, whether we think so or not, whether we admit it or not, the world, the, the world is trying to affect us in all kinds of different ways. And we have to be very careful about what we allow the world, how we allow the world to affect us. And that's not to say, you know, there's a a fine line between being in the world and being of the world. That's not to say that we can all just go hide under a rock and claim to be Christians. God still wants us to evangelize and and go out into the world. But we have to be careful of how we let the world influence us, specifically on our own time. You know, it's it's easy in a big group of people to say, I'm not going to look at that. Or it's easy in public to say, I'm not going to look at that. But it's when you're on your own time, when you don't think anybody is watching or you don't think anybody can see or will ever know, that's when this really applies to us. I had a football coach that used to say, character is what you do when you don't think anyone is watching. What do you do when you don't think anybody's watching? And that will determine what kind of character you have. Next we see ears. Be careful little ears what you hear. I thought, you know, what, 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 pop, what popped into my head was music. Uh, a lot of, we spend a lot of time listening to music. You know, we listen to it in our headphones when we work out. We listen to it when we go for walks. We listen to it when we're, when we're not doing anything else. We listen to it in the car. You know, a lot of our time, we listen to music. Are we thinking about what is actually being said in those songs? Uh, a little while back, I did a uh, bulletin article about that. You know, it's... What we, what we hear when, we're, when, when the music is playing is a lot different than what we hear or what we see when we maybe read those lyrics. You know, take, take some time to study the kind of things you're putting into your mind and the kind of things you're letting into your heart that way. It's easy to just get lost in the words or, you know, say, I like the beat, I don't listen to the words. But you do, whether you think so or not. And those things are going to affect you whether you think so or not. So being careful what we listen to, especially with music. The people we talk to. You know, we, we have a, a great degree, a great deal of control over what we hear. We just don't think so. You know, do the people you talk to, are they the kind of folks that are gossiping or spreading lies or, or cursing or things of that nature? And are you spending time with them 
and listening to them and letting that into your heart. And also false teachers. You know, are you listening to people that are going to lead you astray? You know, whether that be parents or biology teachers or somebody at school, you can put whoever you want there, but if they're leading you away from God, they're a false teacher. And you have to be careful about how much you let that into your, let that into your mind through what you hear, how you, how you listen to them. A powerful point to be made from this can be seen in Matthew 13, 15. For this people's heart have grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear. And the point I want to make here is with all these things as we go through, there's a certain degree of callousness or, or we, can become, we can become unaffected over time. A uh, while back, I think it was probably my first Wednesday that, we, that, we did, that I did a Wednesday lesson, I talked about having a triangle for a conscience. My grandfather had an illustration where he had a triangle for a conscience. And every time you did something that was against your conscience or that you knew was wrong, that, that triangle would hit you in the side. You're like, oh, man, that really hurt. I was really uncomfortable when that just happened. I really did not like how that felt. That really bugged me, however you want to think about it. And then maybe the next time, oh, man. And then every time you do that, you chip off a little bit of that corner. And so before long, over time, you know, what, what was once really upsetting and really bugged you, now is just doesn't even bother you at all because you've, you've chipped away that triangle's corner so long that now you've just got, got a circle. And so now when something happens, it just bounces off the side and nothing matters. You know, when you're really little and you first find out what curse words are and what they mean and how they're bad and stuff like how you shouldn't say them, and you hear one on the radio, oh, man, cover your ears or change, change the song. You know, or, or you, 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 feel like it's, you feel like it's really wrong, and you know it's really wrong, and it really affects you. But then over time, well, it's, you know, it's part of the world. You're not going to find songs that don't have curse words in them. And then before long, you know, you're singing along with those songs, and before long, those words become a part of your vocabulary, and before long after that, you're using them in conversation. And that's the slippery slope that a lot of these things have because we can become callous to these things. If we don't keep ourselves tenderhearted by studying God's word, and by thinking about what God would want us to, God would want us to think about, and, and doing things the way God would want us to do, it's easy to become callous to the world and say, "Oh well, you know, it's just part of the world. You're not going to get away from it. You might as well just deal with it or embrace it or whatever." But in fact, that's pretty far from the truth. There, there are plenty of songs and plenty of movies and plenty of books that are that are going to, at least at the very least, not lead you away from God. And there are many, many songs and books that will lead you closer to God. It's just what you choose to let in. So we have to be careful not to grow callous to these things. Next is be careful little mouth what you say. This isn't, a lot of times, the first thing that came to my mind was, was cursing and lying and gossip and, and backbiting and things of that nature. But also beyond that, what you support. You know, what you, what you give your, but what you put your name behind and your word behind and what you say and how you agree with things. A lot of these things can, can be misleading to other folks on the outside. Matthew 15, 11, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. And James also spends a whole chapter talking about the, the dangers of the tongue and how, you know, out of the, out of the same mouth come, uh, off from the same tongue, we bless God and we curse man. You know, and a lot of this comes back to hypocrisy. You know, saying that that's wrong, but then also saying it yourself or doing it yourself things of that nature, and we have to make sure that we are not living a hypocritical life. Be careful, little hands, what you do. This isn't necessarily, uh, all these things are not necessarily just limited to the physical aspect, but also to the spiritual aspect. You know, what are you doing with your, with your time? What do, you, what do you do when you have free time? How do you, how do you play? What sports do you do? What do you, how, how do you work, and where do you work? Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your money? Where do you spend your energy? All fall into the category, all, all fall into the same kind of category of what you do with your hands. Colossians 3.17 reads, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to the Father, giving thanks to God the Father through him. When we live and when we do things with our hands, number one, are they things that God would have us to do? Are they things that Christ would have us to do? And number two, are we doing them with the attitude of doing them for God? Are you living your life? Are you doing your job? Are you uh, going to school? Whatever you want to put there, are you doing it to the glory of God? Are you living every moment to the glory of God? So when people see you, they don't see you, they see God. 
That's kind of the, the, the lifestyle we need to have as Christians is that in every, in every aspect of our life, we point people to Christ, especially in what we do. Lastly, be careful, little feet, where you go. This, for me, was partially where you go, but also the, the situations you find yourself in and the people you go and hang out with and things like that. 1 Corinthians 15.33, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. If you put yourself in the wrong kind of situation, you're going to, have, you're going to be influenced by those people if you put yourself around the wrong kind of people. Now, again, there's a fine line between being in the world and being of the world. There's a fine line between staying away from those kind of influences, but also helping those influences to know God. But you have to, you have to make sure for yourself that you are self, self-standing, that you are firm in your own faith so that you are not pulled, pulled away from God by those outside sources. It's important to share the gospel with everyone, even the roughest of folks. But we have to know where we stand We have to be firm-footed before we can help someone else to be lifted up. We have to know where we're going before we can point someone else to Christ. So we need to be careful where we go and the situations we put ourselves in and the people that we hang out with because they are going to have an influence on us and we're going to have an influence on them. But we need to weigh, weigh which one is greater before we put ourselves in those situations. It's also important to think about the other side of the coin. All this stuff we've talked about has been you know, things you shouldn't do, things you shouldn't do, things you shouldn't do, things you shouldn't see, things you shouldn't say, things you shouldn't hear. But it's also important to think about the other side of that, the things that you should be doing. Um, Matthew 12, 44, or 43 through 45, talks about the unclean spirit going out of a man, passing through dry places, and then he says to himself, I'm going to return to my previous dwell, dwelling place. And he goes back to that dwelling place, back to that, that person he came out of, and finds everything swept and clean and in order and just empty and ready for him to move back in. And so he goes out and gets seven more demons and comes back and then the state of that person is far worse than it was before. I use the illustration if you know what a depth charge is that's a good illustration for this. A depth charge is something that the military uses to fight against submarines. And basically they drop a big barrel, explosive barrel into the ocean and let it sink to a certain depth and then it blows up, and it makes a big, you can see recordings of it underwater and stuff. Get on YouTube, it's pretty cool. But it makes this giant pocket under the water. And that's kind of what it's like when you, cl- when, you, when you get things out of your life. You push all those things out of your life. You, you say, I'm not going to listen to bad music anymore. And you delete all those songs off your iPod or whatever. And that's great, but that's only half the battle. Because if you don't fill that space with good stuff, then those bad things are going to come crashing back in tenfold. You pushed all that water out of the way and made all this space for you to, for you to grow, but you didn't grow. And now all that water is going to come back in, and that's what really does the damage. The explosion going out doesn't really do all that much damage. You're just moving water. But all that motion and all that weight, all those million, hundreds of gallons of water coming crashing back in is what really does the damage. And that's what we can see in our own life. It's, it's, half the battle is getting rid of those things. Half the battle is saying, I'm not going to do those things anymore. I'm going to get that stuff out of my life. I'm going to cut those ties and whatever I have to do to get myself on the right track. But the other half of the battle is, now I've got all this empty space. Now I've got all this empty free time. or Now I've got all these empty songs, and I'm going to fill them back up with something else. I'm going to fill, you know, I got rid of all my bad books. Good. Very good. But now, go buy some good books. Go buy some commentaries or Bible studies or things like that. I got rid of all my bad songs. Great. That's awesome. Good for you. Now go buy some, some, you know, acapella music or something, you know, or some instrumental music or something like that. Go buy something to refill those spaces. Because if you don't fill those spaces, then those those things are going to come back. You're going to, you know, to, to whatever degree you could compare it, you'll go into, like, withdrawal, and then you'll crash back even harder than you were before. Again, you could compare it to drugs, you know, with withdrawal. You know, it's, you get off of the drugs, and that's great. And then you, may, you maybe go for a little while, but eventually you're going to be tempted again, and it's going to be ten times worse than anything else you've gone through before. If you don't fill up that time and fill up that space with new things and with good things, then those bad things are going to come back in and, and even harder and crush you. Also, we need to think about the influence behind our actions. Our actions or our lack of actions influence those around us. What you say and what you don't say says just as much as what you do and what you don't do. What you see or what you choose to be blind to 
affects not just you, but those that are around you. You know, when you're, when you're watching television and somebody says a bad word, your kids notice when you don't change the channel. You know, when a song comes on that's not appropriate, your kids notice when you sing along. Things of that nature. When, when, when you find, you know, one of the things I remember about my mom, she's gotten a lot better now, and this isn't a bad thing necessarily, but one thing I remember about my mom is she is a voracious reader. She could go through a huge book in just a matter of a couple days. And I remember seeing her all the time, sitting, like, if, if we weren't going somewhere, she, was, she had a book in her hands, and she was reading. But I also remember not thinking about, you know, looking back, not remembering, you know, how often that was the Bible, or how often it was something else. You know, your kids notice that. Your friends and your family notice, oh, well, you made time to read the whole Harry Potter series, but you've never read all the way through the Bible. Or you spent the money to buy your new favorite Taylor Swift album, but... You know, that would have gone a long way in downloading some Christian apps to help you with your walk with God. Things of that nature. People see that, and people, people will be encouraged or discouraged based off your actions and what you do and what you don't do. Romans 12, uh, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Don't be conformed to this world. This world would have you think that they've got some cookie-cutter image of what a person should be. And that if you don't fit that mold, then you're weird, or you're ugly, or you're not special, or you're not popular, or anything else. But that's not true. That's, that couldn't be further from the truth. What this world thinks doesn't matter diddly squat. Or whatever other cool little phrase that means nothing that you want to put in there. But what God thinks matters more than anything else in this life. Your friends may give you grief because you're not up to date on the newest TV show that no one should be watching. Your friends may give you grief, your, you know, your coworkers may give you grief because you've not been keeping up with the Cardinal score like you should. Because you were studying your Bible when everyone else was screaming at the television. You know, your friends and family may give you grief because you don't know what the newest, latest, most popular songs are, most popular artists. But those things are, are okay if you've been filling them with good things. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's okay to not be of this world. It's okay to be out of the loop sometimes. If you are in the loop with God, that's what really matters. Lastly, about these verses, we need to know that they're irreversible. My generation has grown up with a reset button. My generation has grown up with a delete button. My generation has grown up playing games where if you didn't like the turnout, you started over and did it again. That's not real life. I remember my grandmother telling me stories about like typewriters before the delete button and all the grief you had to go through if you made one wrong keystroke. And that was, that was like uncomprehensible. I'm like, why didn't you just delete it? There wasn't a delete button. But why didn't you just delete? There wasn't a delete button. You know, you know, you play you play video games. Well, I don't like the way that turned out. Well, I'll just I'll just go back to my last save. Well, I lost that time. I'll go back. Well, I messed up. Well, I did something wrong. Life's not like that. Your actions are not like that. We we hear we probably have heard the story about like the toothpaste. You know, a kid goes out and spreads some gospel gossip. I always mess that up. <laughs> the gospel is a good thing to spread. Gossip's a bad thing to spread. They just sound the same. Um, you know, a kid goes out and spreads, spreads gossip about someone. And so then the parents find out, and the dad uses an illustration. He gives the kid a, kid, a, a, a bottle of toothpaste. And he says, squirt that all out on the table. Now put it all back in. And, you know, after probably a few, maybe a couple hours of trying to get all the toothpaste back in, he says, Dad, I can't do it. I cannot get all the toothpaste back in. It's not possible. And he says the same thing with your words. When you let something slip that you shouldn't say, you can, you can go back and apologize to that person. You can tell that person face to face that you said that lie or that you spread that rumor or gossip, gossip or whatever. But there are ramifications and ripples, so to speak, that you can't ever catch. You can only do so much. So we need to think about the importance of what we say and how those words can't be taken back. We can be forgiven of them, and we can try to correct them, but to a degree they can't be unsaid. And you think about the same thing with your eyes. The th you know, what images you put in your eyes cannot be unseen. 
You know, you, you'd read some, some army books or military books or World War II books. You'd hear the guys talking about, you know, the things that they've seen that they wish, you know, that they didn't see. Or when they close their eyes, they see these images, these terrible images of war, and how they wish more than anything they could just get those images out of their head. Hopefully we won't have those kind of, those exact things in our mind, but we put things similar to that in our mind. You can't unsee pornography. You can't unread a, a, a sinful book. You can't unwatch a bad movie. So we need to think about those things before we let them into our mind, understanding that they're going in there and they're going to stay, and that eventually they're going to come back out in our actions and in our words and in our, in, in, in our thoughts. And very carefully filter and weigh what we put into our minds. Ephesians 5.16, kind of going along with that, make the best use of the time because the days are evil. Be very careful about what you do with your time and with your life because there's only so much and there's a whole world of people and, and Satan who is trying to take you away from God and trying to send you in the wrong direction. Lastly, be careful, or lastly we see in the song, For the Father up above is looking down in love, so be careful, little eyes, what you see. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. A lot of folks, a lot of times people try and imagine God as some big, you know, cosmological being, you know, maybe big white robes and big white beard or something, or some kid with a magnifying glass trying to burn ants or, you know, waiting to, you know, dangling us over hell, waiting for, you know, us to mess up so he can cast us away. God's our father. And God loves us. And God, God doesn't want us to, to do things that are going to hurt ourselves or that are going to cause separation from him. And he's gone to extreme measures to try and bridge those gaps. You know, everything that God has done from creation to the cross and to now has, has been either to show us his love or his patience, hoping, giving us time to get right with him. Sometimes I wonder if people, you know, I've heard stories about folks whose lives have been spared, you know, from some really dramatic event that should have taken their lives. And they talk about it and they say, you know, God, God was giving me that chance because he knew if I died in that moment, I would be eternally separated from him. But he got, he, he gave me a second chance. He gave me, he was patient with me so that I could come to know him. And on the flip side, none of us know our time. None of us know when we're going to be called home. And we need to be living a life so that when that time comes, we're ready for it. It's, it's, it's said that in the last moments of our life, our life will flash before our eyes. I may have used this illustration before, but it's really powerful. When your life flashes before your eyes, make sure it's worth watching. Make sure you can answer for all the things you saw or were, chose to be blind to. Make sure you can answer for all the things you listened to or ignored. Make sure you can la answer for all the times you said something you should have and for all the times you didn't say something when you should have. All the times that you did something or didn't do something, all the times that you went somewhere or didn't go somewhere. As Christians, we have the responsibility to live like Christ, but we also have forgiveness through Christ. If you've not been living your life in that kind of a lifestyle and you need the encouragement of the church or the prayers of the church and forgiveness of God and the encouragement of those that love you in this family to help you be the kind of person you need to be, or if you've not put on Christ in baptism and you're separated from him leading a false life, please come forward now as we stand and sing. Because he gave